So how how long did you marinate in Carmela Harris, and how do you pronounce her name? <laughs> well, as she she issued an ad when she ran for Senate featuring children to remind everybody exactly how she expected her name to be pronounced, and obviously you know that if she if you divert from that, then you are automatically accused of. Um, all sorts of things, but most of all, it's a very racist thing to do. You saw the what? same accusation go when Donald Trump did his Al Smith dinner speech, said Kamala, and that made a lot of people very angry. Who are still? Very- how can you be racist if you don't know what race she is? Well, she's. Certain- I'm not even sure who I'm discriminated against when I'm discriminated against Carmela Harris or whatever her name is. Right. I imagine that if you if somebody mispronounced your first name, then perhaps you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I if I pronounce my own first name at least two different ways, as she has, we have it on tape. Um, then I think it would be a lot to a- attack other people for for pronouncing it differently. Right. It's something that if you're that insecure about how people pronounce your name, you know, it shouldn't be, you should just be able to either quietly correct them (laughs) or be (laughs) completely, or just go with it. Yeah. But she's made it very clear and spent money to make it clear. This is how I pronounce my name. So how long did you spend like staring at Kamala Harris? Like how long did you work on this book? Right. So I started in January 2023 just doing the research and pulling everything together. So about a year I spent were working on researching writing the book and wrapped it up the first draft by the summer of 23. So uh, just to skip to the end and we'll unpack it of course, but Did, by the end of your research, did you like her more or less? Yeah, probably less. But I learned so much about her that it just seemed, you know, she she frequently talks about, you know, never let anyone else tell your story. You tell your story. She cites this all the time. She cited it last night during the Al Smith dinner video that she did. Never let anyone else tell your story. Never let anyone else tell your story. You tell the story. And that statement strikes me as very fundamentally un-American, right? It seems like if you run for office, then if you tell your story, it's probably not real. There's probably a lot more to the story than your preferred version. And so that was a huge part of it, just finding out more about her. But also just the endless talking about herself. She and everyone in her social class and political party, all they do is talk about themselves. Right, but only in very scripted ways, right? Or how about at all? Like talking about yourself is like, and the the, I would say the main thing I mourn as I look back in the world I grew up in that's now gone, the thing I miss most is the directive that came very clearly from my family. And I think in most families, like shut up about yourself already. Stop talking about yourself. It's not about you, you freaking narcissist. Well, that's why so much of her campaign depends on her identity. No, but have you noticed this? Yeah. I mean, maybe it's just the culture, the Anglo culture I grew up in. Like, you were not welcome to talk about yourself all the time. Mm-hmm. That was considered just uh, uh, not acceptable rude. at all. Not it's acceptable. It's very rude and pompous. Like, right? you don't want to be that person. Yes. Even politicians are kind of encouraged to talk about other people instead of yourself. Of course. Don't but I think for her, a huge much. part of it is just crafting her identity from the very beginning. Yeah. When she first started running for national office, she was very focused on creating this image of her as a person, um, really baking in to her identity. First of all, that she was the product of, that she always cared about politics. She always cared about justice. She grew up marching and shouting with her activist parents who pushed her in a stroller through these protests. And then, you know, skip a few decades, and then suddenly she's sort of the product of uh, the overarching progressive movement that somehow she's always been this progressive liberal who has always been very focused on justice and truth and has made it part of her life and part of her biography when that's not really true. Well, well, it's demonstrably not really true. I'm not sure what is true about a couple of episodes in her life that I've heard really nothing about. And one is her high school years in Canada. And I think any adult 
looking back, will concede that high school is the period that forms you more than any other. And that period in her life was spent, unless I'm misremembering, in Montreal, Canada. Right. A huge part of her life was spent in Montreal. And so you're kind of alienated from any sort of your upbringing. So she's definitely alienated from San Francisco and the Berkeley environment where she was raised, kind of brought to a similar location, academic neighborhood, high middle class, I believe, you know, is was not a not a mid- working or middle class neighborhood in she Montreal in Montreal yeah and she was the product she went to a school with you know a lot of elites in the in the country and was certainly aware of what was going on but it was sort of she was sort of alienated from the overall american experience right well yeah so she did spend her high school years in canada right. and she might have gone home to california for some of the summers i think there's evidence that she did so to visit her dad on a couple occasions, but I don't think she spent much time there. Did she graduate high school in Canada? I think so. And then then she's that- Canadian. I mean, why are we? Pl- <laughs> I'm serious. Like, why are we pretend? It's like Obama, who grew up in Indonesia. I don't and Hawaii. I mm-hmm. don't understand why we're ignoring. Everyone seems to be ignoring the obvious. You know, you are formed by your years in high school, and so she's. Mm-hmm. Well, she was very inspired Canadian. by people in her life, um, people who were in California, to go to Howard. This is definitely a product of Kamala Harris seeking to sort of seize on an, an identity by going to ha- Howard in D.C. as, you know, this historically black university and really sort of embracing that identity and using that as she moved back to California and into the, you know, went to law school in California and sort of jumped into the legal world. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the parallel, Obama's a, a much smarter and more talented, I I think, than Kamala Harris, but there is a similarity in that both of them have these rootless childhoods, not their fault, of course, broken families, pretty tragic family mm-hmm. situation for both of them. And both of them, and, and neither one of them has anything to do with American black culture at all, either genetically or culturally, they've just nothing to do with it. And both of them decide to become American black people. Right. That's why she brings up who she calls her second mother a lot. She was raised in a by her single mom who was always at work. And then uh, in the same building, there was a person who ran a daycare center, Miss Shelton. And this is the woman who is actually from the Black South. She, has is this that the woman black she experience. referred to This is the, person, the woman she refers to as her second mother, in, who's in, a small business owner. She okay, used, so this is yes. the woman she was talking about in her speech. Yes. I was totally confused. Right. So who is this woman? This is uh, Regina Shelton. She ran a daycare business in the same building as, as their apartment. And she helps raise the children while mom's at work. And so she describes this woman as her second mother. And this is the mother who is connected with the Black South that took Kamala to, you know, Kamala talks about her taking them to a Christian Black church where, and even she says they sang in the choir at this church. And so whenever she's in a place where she's speaking to the Black church, she refers to this experience. Whereas when she was running for office in California, her mother- So she went to a Black church once? All the time, apparently, yeah, according okay. to Kamala. Got it. But at the same time, when they were doing magazine articles with Kamala Harris's real mother, she taught, said that, she, and they were speaking to certain audiences, her real mother said that she grew up in the Hindu temple and practiced all of the <laughs> traditions and uh, and uh-huh. believed in all the Hebrew, in all the Hindu uh, religious practices. So and, she was actually a polytheist. In childhood. Right. And when she first starts running for office, there's there's a couple incidents where she starts referring to um, this Hindu goddess. Um, and <laughs> Wait, using what? her, she uses this Hindu goddess, at, I think it's Pavarti, um, who is both, she's both a vengeful warrior and also someone who's very loving. And so she refers to this goddess as, as someone who inspired her career decision to get into law enforcement and justice. So there's Wait, the, what? Yeah. So she a will, goddess. Yes, um, Hindu goddess inspired her to get into justice. Someone who, who can be both a vengeful goddess, but also a caring and loving goddess. Was she suggesting that this goddess was real? Right. 
this this character in her in the mythology of the Hindu religion. I don't think it's considered mythology. I think it's considered real. Oh, from if you truly believe in. Well, yeah, if you're a Hindu, right. I don't. I don't think right. you think it's fake. I think you think it's real. It's unclear, and it may be entirely fake. real, by the way. Right, but, but from it's... a Christian perspective, that's demonic. <laughs> so, no, I'm not right. kind of taking sides, though. I have right. an opinion, Clearly. but um, obviously, but as a as a theological matter, mm-hmm. th- those couldn't be more incompatible with each other. Like you can't. Unless you're running for political office, right? Then you can right, take but those the are the opposites. That's like saying, you know, it's like, you know, going to a PETA conference in the morning and you know, cattle rancher conference in the afternoon and saying, I love you both. Like, that's just not possible. But those are the best politicians. To do that, <laughs> okay, right? right. <laughs> okay, you covered the White House for a long time. You're more cynical than I am. Okay, that's just interesting. So she said she was inspired by a goddess. Right, a Hindu goddess to- Again, get- from a Christian perspective, a demon. Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that's what Christians right, think. Right. Um, I guess in the end, but she we'll also find out sang right. in the Black Choir and about justice and learned mm-hmm. about justice and and loving thy neighbor. Was she a cantor in her synagogue too? Do you know? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> that maybe that's Doug's role. Although I don't know if he goes to synagogue very much. I don't think so. <laughs> um, okay, amazing. Has she ever talked about the Canadian part of her childhood? No, not much. Oh, yeah. Um, that definitely came from her mother in some of her earliest profiles, um, back when they were just running for her first office as district attorney yeah, and trying to make the case that she was a, a real genuine person who really wanted the job and had an ident- cultural identity that was close with San Francisco and, uh, really made the best case for her as she was sort of running for office. And she mentioned Canada then? No, no, Canada was not in the, uh, okay. in the... But but the goddess Preferred stuff version. was, yeah, a little bit, yeah, for sure. Amazing. Um, so the Howard University years, did she participate at all politically at Howard that we know of? Well, she has a photo right of her protesting at some march on Washington, but that's pretty much the extent of it. She also interned in a, in, on Capitol Hill with the senator. Um, but other than that, there doesn't seem to be much, very much political democratic activity going senator. on. She's, yeah, a Democratic senator. Um, and it's very clear that she's really just enjoying being at college, as most of us were when we were in college, just enjoying being at college. And I don't think the activist streak was very strong back hmm. then. Um, so I think the, the first time that most Americans who are not from California noticed Kamala Harris was during the Kavanaugh hearings. Right. But even before that, um, when she won in 2016, she was sort of the one of the small victories for women at a time when their greatest champion, Hillary Clinton, was vanquished by, at the time, Donald Trump. Right. And so when she declares victory in 2016, her, her race for Senate, she tears up her speech and delivers something entirely different, um, really trying to inspire and encourage everybody who's watching and vow to be the next great fighter who's going to go to Washington, D.C. and sort of stop Donald Trump. That's kind of her her first message. And one of the very first things she does— Was that election night? Yeah, election wow. night in November 2016. Did she ad-lib that speech? No, I think she and her staff went behind the scenes and rewrote it. Yeah. Yeah, very quickly, because they saw that things were not going well for the Democratic Party. Hmm. And one of her first things she did when she got to Washington was deliver a big speech at the Women's March and basically saying, we are here to fight. And so... Would that was the Pink Hat March? Yeah. I got caught in that by accident. Uh, most of us who were in the Capitol were, right? It yeah, was well, very... I, was, I was just driving um, to the gym to play squash, actually. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden... It was over, yeah. My car was surrounded by all these fat ladies in pink hats. And I remember <laughs> thinking, I don't know what the... You know, I'm from D.C. I've been there m- most of my life and i never seen all these people on 17th Street. It was one of those days that was very big. Like some protests, you have to really s- try to sell it as a, as a big protest. No, no, that was... That was a big march. Yeah, and as someone who's really from the bottom of my heart pro-women, I just have always mm-hmm. really liked women. Um, I started to rethink my position on women just watching the people at that mm-hmm. speech. They were the most physically unattractive, unhappy... 
people I think I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, they were just really a gruesome bunch. It was like there was also a lot of like really like intelligent feminists from Washington, liberal intelligent feminists who were out in the streets. They're so unhappy. It was like every unhappy chick from Bethesda was there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like the moms you see at the grocery store who just like hate their weak husbands. And I just didn't realize that there were a half a million of those people in the area, but there were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very... uh, So she spoke at that. What did she say? Right. She, uh, well, it's very interesting because part of her was still kind of clinging to this idea that uh, a a regular agenda was a female agenda. She talks about how, you want to talk about women's issues? I will talk to you about finance. I will talk to you about education. Really trying to separate. Do women have something special to add in those areas? Right. It was like she was just trying to say that during the speech, she makes the case that, you know, all issues are women's issues. There's What's no, feminist no, economics look like? Yeah. That was kind of her <laughs> point, right? It's just like, uh-huh. okay. but uh, eventually I think because of the woman's march, she kind of s- does sort of slip into this agenda. And certainly with the, uh, the, the issue of abortion, she really kind yeah. of embraced that. But yeah, her so first speech So the idea is that, the, that women should not have kids. Women should have the freedom to kill their children <laughs> right. in utero, okay. right? So. It makes them more powerful. Right. Does what? Did she mention the goddess when she said that? No, okay. this is the new Kamala Harris. This is Washington. I somehow Kamala feel like Harris. the goddess may be inspiring that position, but I can't prove it. Right. Um, okay, so she gave a talk at the Women's March. Was I'm jogged my memory. Was that a big deal? Was she a major speaker that She was day? one of many. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, they get all the senators up on the stage at the same time. Right. They each get a couple minutes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, as soon as she got to the Senate, she spent a lot of time just, you know, clashing with Trump appointees, right? Because that's right. what you do when you first get to the Senate. Right, you, yeah, they, for they, sure. They, get, they pick their cabinet and right. they, they go through the, the hearings. and Grandstand if you can, the If you can make a splash, then yeah. you can make a name for yourself. And so... Yeah. One of her first things, she torments uh, General Kelly, who was widely respected bipartisan uh, majority of senators who viewed General Kelly as a true public servant. And she was, yeah. she was one of the ones that clashed with him and um, prosecuted him and, and basically made a name for herself on all the different appointees. And then, yes, then after that, it was the whole... Um, Jeff Sessions' Russia thing. She made a big name of herself then, you know, grilling Jeff Sessions and getting him to admit that if he's rushed, then he gets nervous. And that was a whole big viral moment, you know, with the with the dawn of C-SPAN. Every every senator, every congressman is looking for these sort of viral moments yeah. to, you know, springboard them in the future. And so she really got this reputation as, as being a fighter, someone who could take on the Trump people and make them look foolish. Hmm. What happened with Kavanaugh? Right. With Kavanaugh, it was a time of desperation for the left. And for many senators who were thinking about running for president, it was your chance. I call it like the Kavanaugh primary. Whoever does the best against Kavanaugh is going to earn the respect from the left as you prepare your run for president. Yep. So this is creepy, but it's true and it's worth knowing. Every time you use the internet, you are being watched. You are not alone. Private businesses do it, government actors, our country and others, all of it. Internet traffic, including yours, is mined like a precious commodity. It's bought and sold and it's used to manipulate what you think, what you buy, and yes, even how you vote. It's a big deal and it's a huge market. Your internet provider can see every single website you visit, all of them. And in the United States, they're allowed to sell your data, even your browsing history, to the highest bidder. Did you know that? And that includes everything you do inside a so-called incognito or private browser window. Don't fool yourself. They're watching you always. So if you think that should be illegal, obviously we agree with you. It should be put out of business, these companies, immediately. But in the meantime... You should protect yourself. The way that we do it is with ExpressVPN. That's an easy-to-use app that encrypts and reroutes all your internet traffic through secure servers, so they can't see it. Because we use ExpressVPN, our internet providers cannot see our browsing history. Simply put, we've got nothing to sell because they don't have anything on us. That's important to us. It's probably important to you, too. So if you think internet privacy only matters to drug traffickers, people are doing shady things, think again. 
privacy is a prerequisite for freedom. No privacy, no freedom. And the truth is, we have all seen how activists and power-hungry government actors have tried and succeeded in getting people fired or even thrown in jail for saying the wrong thing or having the wrong opinions. Protecting your personal data is essential. It's the beginning of reclaiming your freedom. ExpressVPN hides your your IP address. That's a number that reveals your actual identity on the internet. It's unique. Because we hide our IP address with ExpressVPN, data brokers can't use it to build a profile on us to sell off to marketers or other governments or our own government. That happens too. By the way, hiding your IP address is really useful when you want to appear to be somewhere you're not. And that's your prerogative, by the way. We used it in Moscow to get our reporting out of the country. We've used it around the world. We always use it. You can also use it to access geo-restricted content from anywhere. So if you're in a country that doesn't allow you to use an app, you can with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has server locations in over 100 countries around the world. That's like having 100 different passports right on your phone. So I'm not a tech expert, obviously, and if I can use it, you can too. It's really easy. You just tap one button and you're connected. They have apps for every device you own or even potentially own. iPhone, any kind of phone, laptop, tablet, even your smart TV. Anything that uses the internet can use ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN has been rated number one by CNET, The Verge, and a lot of other tech reviewers. We have it. You should too. Right now, TuckerCarlson.com listeners can get three extra months free at expressvpn.com slash Tucker. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Tucker for three extra months for free. And so she spent a lot of time interrupting, forcing, um, angrily, aggressively pursuing Kavanaugh and trying to get him to trip up. If you, if you remember the famous moment when she kind of made up this story, when she's asking about whether or not he ever discussed the Russia case with any lawyer from this Kasowich firm in Washington. And Kavanaugh's being very careful because he doesn't want to be pushed into a perjury trap. But he says, you know, I can't think of any. Is there a moment that you're thinking about? And she's indicating that, yes, there is a moment she's thinking about. And she's like, but you're not going to tell me, are you? And Kavanaugh's still being very careful. And it turns out, like, she never had any evidence of this ever happening, but she wanted to get him, wanted to catch him in this moment. And ultimately, reporters were kind of surprised by the end of this great exercise that, oh, wow, she has no evidence that he ever met or spoke about the case with the lawyer from this firm. Um, But yeah. It was back in the days when anything Russia, Russia, Russia related was hot political news, right? If you could yeah. ever just smear anybody with the very whiff of Russia, uh, it was always like a considered a great victory, which kind of pales in comparison now. Yeah, looking back, like the stupidity of that is just awe-inspiring. The it was one of the things. no of the Russia stuff. Like oh, there was, right. it was. The idea that the Trump campaign was colluding with anybody, you know, to to actually believe that you would have to know nothing about what the Trump campaign was really like, where they were, you know, it was a little disorganized. They were not right. even colluding with each other, as you know. <laughs> and right. um, there was ne- never, I mean, that was like insane. It, it was evidence-free. Russia was not a threat to the United States. There were a couple of other countries that were playing in a huge way in our elections and still are. No one will ever mention them. Mm-hmm. It's not Russia, <laughs> to put it mildly. Everyone in D.C. knows that. Russia had no role whatsoever in our domestic politics. And they had no sort of agenda that would affect our core interests. So, like, the whole thing was just nuts. And everybody went along with it. Everybody went along with it. Right. Right. Like everybody, just like the, from the force of repetition, just because, you know, every channel, every newspaper, every day was talking about Russia. People were like, you know, I really think there's something there. Like, what? It just showed how dumb everybody was. They're all just herd animals, including friends of mine, for whom I lost a lot of respect. I was like, okay, I'm open-minded. I'm kind of agnostic on Russia and I'm willing to believe anything. So mm-hmm. where's the evidence? <laughs> yeah. Did you know, do you remember this? Yeah, I do. 
And it was it's always very puzzling because it started from this dossier, right, that they always had in their back yeah. pocket, but didn't use it during 2016 because they didn't think they had to. Right. But once Trump won, it was the first thing that they pulled out of their pockets. They're like, wow, we can actually use this. Was Harris recognize. big on the Russia thing? Not too much. Um, right. She she prosecuted uh, different Trump officials. She did get Bill Barr one time you know, asking him if Trump had ever asked him to sort of stop the investigation. And he he found himself sort of fumbling for words and yeah. couldn't really answer the question. So she did have some good moments there. But yeah, I think a lot of it was just, she was seen as somebody who was fighting. She had this opposing, you know, she was fighting something else, right? And, and people placed that excitement because she was the one doing the fighting against this force that they were very unhappy about. Hmm. So how did, if you were to summarize how she behaved during the Kavanaugh hearings, um, I mean, I think I remember her going all in on the rape stuff or sexual assault stuff. Right, right. She was very, very adamant about supporting Christine Blasey Ford and it was also around the Me Too movement, right? She was very... She very she honed in on that as a political force that would help her. So when it came to that, she was just very intent on pushing her, Christine Blasey Ford as this as this hero, as this patriot. You know, she repeatedly claimed that she believed her when she first spoke before she even met her. Um, she repeatedly said that you know she was a patriot and a hero for coming forward, and she really thought that this was the moment that she could really push through and stop Kavanaugh. You know, Democrats didn't have much to go on. But when, when they found out that Dianne Feinstein had this letter from Christine Ford, who wished to remain anonymous, um, different, you know, she confronted Feinstein about the letter. Like, you better address this. Once reports started leaking out about the existence of this letter, she confronted Feinstein and said, you better address this or it's going to look real ugly for you. So Feinstein was eventually forced out to make this letter public to bring them in, to bring her into the conversation, even though she wanted to remain anonymous. And so this woman was ultimately pulled into the fight and senator, senators and Senate staff who were, went through that. It was a very tough time for a lot of people in the Senate. Whatever happened, so Christine Blasey Ford, this is all coming back to me. It was, about, there was a high school party in Bethesda. Mm -hmm. It always starts in Bethesda, doesn't it? <laughs> and, um, which is a suburb of DC. Right of course, in Maryland, Montgomery County. And the, and Kavanaugh supposedly at this high school party 40, 35 years before had acted badly and sexually assaulted Christine Blasey Ford. Is that, that was right, the core allegation? Right, that was her. Uh, so then Blasey Ford basically destroyed her life, correct? Right. I, I You know, maybe she's still a progressive hero among some, but you certainly... We've seen this story before where the Democrats will pull an unsuspecting character to weaponize against the Republican Party right. and just sort of cast them aside when it's all over. Well, exactly. Nicely right. put. That's right. exactly right. Like, whatever happened, Christine Blasey Ford is no longer a hero. Right. Right? Like George Floyd. It's like he, she was useful for a, a news cycle. They upended her life. And then I don't, I don't think they've... Like name yeah, it makes you it makes chairs me, after her. It makes since. me think of all the moms who lost their sons in Iraq, how they were weaponized and exactly. held up as paragons of, you know, this is why the Bush administration is evil because we have this poor woman who's suffering the loss of her son. They would hoist them up and bring them to all the speeches, and then yeah, and now all those moms are against the moms who have hostages is in in you know Israel. No, it's totally they right. brought them on stage, and then it turns out, oh, we can't help your child who's being held hostage. No, it's we so smart. able to help them either, but we were able to use them politically to... It's funny, all those case. Iraq moms who were marching against Trump, I mean, rather against Bush. Right. They all have my sympathy, speaking for myself, but they, um, you know, now the Democratic Party that once, you know, promoted them and called them heroes is aligned with Dick Cheney and his repulsive little daughter. 
Right. It's, <laughs> you still have, <laughs> you know, like whatever you happened. You still that, have remnants of the Code Pink out there. Exactly. That, they certainly aren't the champions that they No, were I'm made. on their side. The media, and we're yeah. no longer hailing no, them as exactly. the champions Sorry. of truth and justice. Sorry to digress, Charlie, but it's just, <laughs> it's just interesting. You're it's a funny thing I've it forgotten is, about. It is a, an interesting time to revisit for sure. So, but Kamala Harris becomes more a national figure after falsely accusing. Right. Brett Kavanaugh of sexual assault four right. years ago is that that claiming idea? I believe the believe all women believe the victims right this whole Me Too movement that was kind of around 2018 I believe the tw- 17 18, right around this yeah. time that Kavanaugh was sort of brought up and right like the the entire movement was kind of leveraged in this whole thing where it's like believe all women and that's our new platform for the Democratic Party Do, so women don't lie ever no. Especially about this. Because they're Hindu goddesses or something. They're <laughs> incapable of lying. I don't know. I don't know about it's that. It's funny but. to find out that 51% of the population just doesn't lie. Everything they say is just gospel. It's just true. Well, you're supposed to because, you know, that's the, those are the new marching orders. Uh-huh. Only it turns out that it didn't go so well. Does that apply to Candace Owens or just just Christine Blasey Ford? Um Right. Just. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, all, it's just funny to look back. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you, but it's just funny to right. look back. It's like a time capsule. It's You remember these moments, and in retrospect, they're so completely absurd. It's hard to believe that Martha Raddatz and Joe Scarborough and all these other supposedly educated people are saying this stuff with a straight face on television. Well, especially the Me Too movement. I mean, believe Kamala all Harris. women? Are you joking? Yeah. No. Kamala, Kamala How about no? Harris. <laughs> And Kamala Harris was one of the first to see this as like a politically advantageous position to take, the Me Too movement. So Uh there's video of her um, marching in San Francisco at a parade championing the Me Too movement. And Uh who's who's along with her? um, Noted celebrity Jesse Smollett. Not really. He is also right beside her in a Me Too Juicy Smollett was a Me Tooer also? was a Me Tooer back in 2018. And they're both... Chanting, you know, up, up with education, down, down with deportation. So they're also protesting. You're making this up, Charlie. (laughs) They're also protesting immigration, wearing Me Too movement gear. But what's interesting about that, and if you look at the Me Too movement as a political force, look at what they did to Al to uh, Al Franken. Oh yeah, he was one of the first Democratic victims of the Me Too. I defended him. Right. He wouldn't defend himself. He's such a cuck. He wouldn't even defend himself. He did oh. nothing wrong. Oh, right. So he was he was a rising political star. Yeah. People were actively, he had just published a book. People yes. were actively talking about him as maybe he's the answer to Donald Trump. He found this populist movement in Minnesota that pretty much vanquished the Republican Party in the state. Yeah. And was this like awkward, weird anti-Trump, right? And so people were actively talking about him as a possible presidential candidate. But then when, you know, these allegations start coming out about his behavior, who are the first ones to seize on it? All the Democratic women senators who were also interested in running a presidential campaign. <laughs> I think it was, I think it was Christian Gillibrand that fired the first shot. She's the worst. Alia. Not her real name, by the way. <laughs> I can't remember oh, really? her real name. No, it's all <laughs> fake. Um, I wish I could remember her real name, but it, it's not even close to Kirsten Gillibrand. But um, anyway. Amy but the, Klobuchar, Kamala Amy, Harris, they're all- Klobuchar did that? They all band together and march to Schumer's office and say, he's got to go. And, and he actually obeyed them. Right. Well, him and all his colleagues were, you know, when Schumer pulls him into the office and says, I can't defend you. I can't fight for you. What are you going to do? Are you going to fight for yourself and go be raked over the coals for the rest of your life? Or do you just go away quietly? It seems in Franken's case, he didn't want to fight. The, I, I know Franken well and have known him for 25 years. Yeah. yeah. But he's a pretty clever guy, um, has good qualities. People in the Senate always had good things to say. But yeah, I mean, I never hated Al Franken, but right. he was ultimately all he really cared about was left-wing ideology and just such a sad- And being liked. I think broken liked guy, being yeah. Liked. Um, but again, you know, charming guy, talented guy, more talented than most U.S. senators mm-hmm. for sure, but so weak inside. Sure. I think bossed around by his wife. That was always my impression. Franny from Portland, Maine, as I recall. <laughs> but- um, 
but the point is he didn't do anything wrong. And if he had just ridden it out for a week and just let it just hunker down, you know, go to Barbados for a week, come back, he'd be fine. He was an elected United States Mm senator and he gave up his seat voluntarily because four ambitious girls didn't like him. I mean, wow. What right. a loser. <laughs> Are you serious? Right. You would certainly expect. And more people started fighting back ultimately. But at the time, they were very afraid of the movement. But it can was you very much if a- you were Al Franken and you just dishonor yourself and your family, your kids are ashamed. You go down in history as some sort of sexual assaulter, right? some sort of crypto rapist. You give up your own Senate seat that you really fought hard for. Just because Kirsten Gillibrand or whatever her real name is right. wants what you have, can you imagine mm-hmm. the regret he must feel? Right. I th- and I think a lot of Democratic donors were not happy with that. Certainly with Gillibrand. A lot of Democratic donors were not happy. When she ran for president in Iowa, yeah. kind of ended very shortly afterwards well, she's because the worst. Democratic donors were still furious at her well, she's taking Franken off the table. completely false person. I'd take Carmela Harris any day over Kristen Gillibrand. Oh, really? I th- There's something about Gillibrand that's just really, um, she's just- New Yorker. So ruthless. Oh my right. gosh. You have to be. That's fascinating. So, yeah. so Harris joined the chorus against, mm-hmm. against uh, Al Franken. Right. At the same time, she has somebody in her office that is also under investigation for his own Me Too stuff when he was back in California. So someone in her her close circle, uh, I don't want to get his name wrong, but it was somebody very close who was being investigated by, you know, the justice system in California. They ultimately had, she was, he was sued by a woman for inappropriate behavior and they eventually had to award this woman a big payout because of things that he had done to her in her, in his office, in his previous job. Yeah. Um, When Kamala Harris is informed about it, she has no idea. She's shocked. I had no idea that this was even happening. Well, if he was currently having this case being taken that was already underway by all the rules of the Me Too movement, you're supposed to get rid of this person as soon as you hear about it. Execute him, yeah, right. of course. But to have someone on his staff, on her staff who was involved in this whole situation and then suddenly claim ignorance when the ruling is issued really doesn't pl- pass a smell test. Well, also, I mean, Kamala Harris got her job because she was having sex with a married older man, Willie Brown, and then she was Montel Williams' side piece. So it's like, I'd love to know her actual perspective on sexual politics. It's a little bit different from maybe what she's saying. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Right. Right. I mean, if there's one anti-feminist in the state of California, it's Willie Brown. Right. You think? Although he very much loved to see himself as a feminist. No, but I mean, in real life. Right. But he would bring, he would host these events that featured only women. And he would talk about how these were great woman empowerment summits. I think they're known as ladies, for one thing. <laughs> and second, like, look, I, I like Willie Brown. I'm not attacking right. Willie Brown. I think he's hilarious because I think he's a little bit more honest. But like, Very honest. If there's anybody whose life violates the principles of second wave feminism, it's Willie Brown. Right. I mean, on, honest. I right. mean, really. Willie right. Brown? Yeah, right. Okay. I think that's uh, right. <laughs> it's like well, even only... even Bill Clinton described him as the real slick Willie. <laughs> <laughs> Did he really say that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Now you're making me like them both because I, you know, you just like flashes of honesty wherever you find them. Right. Willie Brown was this character in California politics that couldn't be brought down by corruption, but he always t- he was always teasing and joking about corruption. Yeah. I mean, very... If you're having sex with Willie Brown in order to get a job, you know, whatever you can deal with your own conscience and with your own Hindu goddess on that, you know, Mm -hmm. but you definitely can't lecture me on feminism if you've done that. I think it's fair to say, right? I think so. I think when you talk to women, (laughs) they would, they would agree with that statement. You, you, you know, you give up your, you you gain a lot. You get to be attorney general of the state of California and the U S Senator and vice president, but you, you do give up your right to lecture me about feminism. Right. Is that fair? I think a lot of women would agree with that. I think that's right. right. I'm just being, I'm not judging. I'm, Sure. But she she's not allowed to judge either. I guess that's what I'm saying. It's certainly not without evidence. 
right? It's yeah. Like, that was the whole- Sorry, you had sex with Willie Brown to get a job, so why don't you cool that kinda, like, it on the off, feminism stuff? We, as you discussed with a previous guest, like, yeah. the, it kicked off her entire career. And oh, it of course it did. It wasn't yeah. just that. It was he, you know, Willie Brown gave her positions of power on state boards, gave her that paid handsomely. You mm -hmm. know, she made a, up to- Four hundred thousand dollars back yeah. in the nineties. From can these you positions? be specific about which positions? Uh, uninsured. Just, just, just kidding, insured. Charlie. Now I'm getting <laughs> vulgar again. <laughs> no, but, like, oh, I, yeah. The, the, well, yeah. And then she made so she made about four hundred thousand dollars over a couple of years just from these once a month state board positions. And that's like you adjust that for today's dollars. That's like almost a million dollars. Oh yeah. And then bought her the key. You know, bought her a BMW. Helped pay for her wardrobe. Um, really turned her in to Kamala Harris. So the, there are two ways to look figure. at this. And as a charitable man who instinctively likes women and likes kind of plucky up from the bootstrap stories, mm -hmm. I think you could tell that story in an honest way that might make you admire Kamala Harris. Here's this woman who doesn't know anybody. She's from Canada. You know, she doesn't, she's not from the area, really. She's, I think, from She Oakland. was working at the Alameda County... Yeah, exactly office. right in the, in the East Bay, right? And she winds up becoming Attorney General of the biggest state, and she's willing to do whatever it takes to get that, including have sex with Willie Brown and Monta Williams. If you told a story that way, I'd say, well, you know, morally it's obviously mal malodorous, but on the other hand, this woman has a lot of um, a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. She's focused. She does she's what it determined. takes to get what she wants exactly right. And she's totally self-made. And I think Willie Brown really opened her up to this world of the possibility. For sure. If you're a young prosecutor at the age of 29 and you see what's possible, but being on the arm of Willie Brown. You just have to have sex with Willie Brown. Why wouldn't you look at that and say, I can seize this for myself as long as I show up and demand it. Sure. And, and Willie Brown taught her how to do that. He talks about it in his book, like in order to get into wealthy white worlds, you force your way into these positions of influence, like on museum boards and the arts and, you know, the charities, and you present yourself as this figure, then they'll welcome you into these worlds and they'll hoist you up onto these political platforms. But, but, okay, that's all fine. I get it. I mean, it's a form of prostitution, but, I, you know, I try not to judge. All I'm saying is, why would you be self-righteous and scolding? If mm -hmm. you, like, you, she has no right to be self-righteous about anything or scold anyone. And she doesn't need to. By the way, she could just, I don't know, tell her story honestly. And people might say, I would say, yeah, I, I kind of get it. You know, she made something out of not much. And I admire that. Why does she have to lecture the rest of us about the civil rights movement? Right. It's because it's politically advantageous at this point. We kind of see that. But it's that. disgusting. Right. We've told you before about Hallow. It is a great app that I am proud to say I use, my whole family uses. It's for daily prayer and Christian meditation, and it's transformative. As we head into the start of school in the height of election season, you need it. Trust me, we all do. Things are going to get crazier and crazier and crazier. Sometimes it's hard to imagine even what is coming next. So with everything happening in the world right now, it is essential to ground yourself. This is not some quack cure. This is the oldest and most reliable cure in history. It's prayer. Ground yourself in prayer and scripture every single day. That is a prerequisite for staying sane and healthy and maybe for doing better eternally. So if you're busy on the road, headed to kids' sports, there's always time to pray and reflect alone or as a family, but it's hard to be organized about it. Building a foundation of prayer is going to be absolutely critical as we head into November, praying that God's will is done in this country and that peace and healing come to us here in the United States and around the world. Christianity obviously is attack, under attack everywhere. That's not an accident. Why is Christianity, the most peaceful of all religions, under attack globally? Did you see the opening of the Paris Olympics? There's a reason. Because the battle is not temporal, it's taking place in the unseen world. It's a spiritual battle, obviously. So try Hallow. Get three months completely free at Hallow. That's Hallow.com slash Tucker. If there's ever a time to get spiritually in tune and ground yourself in prayer, it's now. Hallow will help personally and strongly and totally sincerely recommended. Hallow.com slash Tucker. But that's 
democratic politics. Shut up, honey. You're from through. Canada. <laughs> Stop telling me about the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Like you had nothing to do with that. Right. No? Right. But she's not from Alabama, no. right? No. No. <laughs> she definitely uh embraced this agenda as her own. Yeah. And embraced embraced her identity. If, any, if anybody questions her identity, she's just like, I'm not even gonna take the time to discuss this with you with you. Um, if you have a problem with me being black, that's your problem. Being black. <laughs> oh, so black. Oh, it's hilarious. Right. And when you talk to black women in, in politics, like, they know. But they also see her as someone who could do the job. It's just so fake. So well, uh, she did uh, Brett Baer's show the other night. Right. It's the first interview I've ever seen where after the interview – Everyone tells you, ignore all the substance of everything she said and focus only on the style. All of her defenders are like focusing on the style. Like, wow, just the fact she, that she did this interview, she won. Whereas... What, do an interview with Brett Baer that's so <laughs> win? I mean, what, it's all so stupid. But what I, I didn't read any of the coverage of it because, it, you know, the lesson was obvious for me. I didn't need to be told what the lesson mm -hmm. was. But I... I was really struck by how angry and touchy she was, defensive she was, nasty she was, skillless she was. You've seen a million of her interviews. Is she always, is that a theme that you've noticed in the past? This is something that was very much a product that sort of boosted her on the public stage, which is why she's trying to repeat it. You know, she had a better than expected debate against Donald Trump. Yeah. Because she was able to tangle with him and demonstrate that she I thought she did toe a to toe. pretty good job. Right. Not bad. Right. She she needed that, the opposition force to campaign against. Like, yes. she needs Trump. If she doesn't have Trump, what does she have? And so I think that that was part of the calculus of doing the Fox News interview. It's like, if I can just go against something, and if I can just stand tall and get in a fight with Brett Baer, then I look better by comparison. She looked like a total asshole. I mean, that was just my view. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I'm completely out of it. I you know, it's nothing to do with her gender. She just was like screechy and defensive and mad. Is she, right. have you seen other interviews like that with her? Is no. that how she always is? It's very interesting because, and I talk about this in the book a lot, is this, when she was sort of this like democratic champion in the Senate, where she mm -hmm. was known for repeatedly fighting and getting angry and, and doing her utmost to, you know, crush Kavanaugh. I think she realized at some point that if I'm going to run for president, I need to like, be sort of a little more than just this opposing force. I need to have an idea, a, an identity that attracts Americans to vote for me for president. And so that's when she introduces this concept of a joyful warrior. She makes a hard pivot away from the fighter and goes on Ellen and delivers this elegant sol soliloquy about the importance of being a joyful warrior, about loving your country and fighting for your country and not being angry all the time. She had multiple interviews where she's like, I'm tired of being mad all the time and I want to be a joyful warrior. Did she use the phrase joyful warrior? Repeatedly, repeatedly. Um, on Ellen, in magazine profiles, she completely... And this is, this is actually before Kavanaugh because she has this reputation of being a fighter in the Senate. Then she pivots to be a joyful warrior around 2018. <laughs> then she pivots back to the vengeful warrior when she's fighting Kavanaugh. Uh -huh. And then by the time she's ready to announce her campaign for president in 2019, early 2019, she sort of pivots back to this idea that I'm a joyful warrior and all I care about is speaking truth. Joyful. So you've looked pretty closely at her life. You just wrote a book about her. How many instances did you stumble across of joy? True, genuine joy, very hard to find. Very hard to find. It she's very guarded. Way. She's very guarded. She's a very private person, and she's uncomfortable talking about herself. She talks about it all the time. She's just like, I'm just not comfortable talking about myself. But she never stops talking about herself, I notice. Except in the specific ways, like being raised in a middle-class family, being the product of her community. Being What community is she talking about? Right, the San Francisco community. But she's from Canada. Right. Like, but what the hell is she as talking a politician, about? politician, when she's talking about the community, she's talking about her childhood community that she grew up in, leaving the Canada part out entirely, and then just pretending she's always been from Oakland, which she's actually from Berkeley, but she doesn't like to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what 
yeah, I am from that area, so I know it well. And mm-hmm. there are like no black people there. I don't even know what she's talking about. Oh, really? They're in in San Francisco, no. Oh, there's like one and a half black neighborhoods, tiny percentage of the population. I think well, San she's, Francisco, she is the daughter of an academic elite, right? Her yeah, father Jamaican and mother, guy too, right? right? Her father and mother were sort of hard left academics. They were not necessarily the marching and shouters. I mean, I'm sure they went to a few protests, but they were very much intellectual activists. They were very. Can I ask? On. Is um, her, her father attacked her at one point? Didn't he? Right, and this is for using her Jamaican identity to sort of defend the idea of smoking weed, legalizing weed. Yeah, he was horrified by that. It's the rare occasion where he just, without permission, went out and wrote an angry essay. essay you know, explicitly saying, "I wish, I wish, I wish to categorize, you know, categorically disassociate myself from this brand that she's selling of her Jamaican heritage being the reason why she supports legalized marijuana." Yeah, because I mean, if you actually are Jamaican, the idea that everyone in Jamaica's, you know, Peter Tosh is right. offensive. It's offensive, right? He was very angry by so that. So she doesn't get along with him, then clearly. No. No, and then he is he, he around was today? forced to take that. Actually, he lives in Washington D.C. What? Yeah, Harris's father lives in Washington D.C. The father who denounced her. Right. What does he do? What's this? Tell me that story. Why haven't I heard that? Yeah, um, we had some reporters from the Daily Mail, which is where I work, and yeah. uh, they sort of tracked him down. And he does actually live in a house not too far away from Kamala Harris, and it does not look like they spend a lot of time together, if at all. I think the last time he posted photos of an adult Kamala Harris and him together were from many years ago before she came to Washington. And he does a lot of work with uh, economics and Jamaica and the World Bank. I don't, but he's also semi retired at this point. So, yeah, he's just kind of this figure that exists in DC but has no close connection with his daughter. Has he ever talked about her other than to write an op ed attacking her? He wrote in a, a brief piece about his Jamaican heritage and how. Kamala Harris was connected to that. Uh, he wrote that for a Jamaican newspaper where he talks about his life and, you know, having Kamala at a, at a young age and then, you know, becoming distanced and it eventually estranged entirely from her. Um, yeah, it's a very sad story. He talks, he writes in his book, his book about, you know, Marxist ec- economics. He talks about, you know, <laughs> this book is dedicated to my daughters, Kamala and Maya. For, and I, from whatever relationship we have. Like, it's a little bit of a sad story because it seems like he was kind of pushed out of the family's life entirely after after quite some time. Yeah. Um, he, I mean, he wasn't at any of her victory parties for her political races. He did not attend her inauguration. Kamala never personally invited him to an inauguration. I think the Times did a story a couple of weeks ago that said somehow he got an invitation through an intermediary but he was never asked personally to come by his daughter. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah, women who are mad at their dads, you know, tend to, um, not all, but a lot of them end up at wearing pink hats at women's marches. And in general, if you're a father and your daughter grows up to be a man hater, it's probably kind of your fault. I think. Right. Yeah. yeah. Fair. You sort of take on that responsibility. You know. <laughs> well, yeah. Kinda, you know that, yeah. You know that it's your your fault, right? Yeah, it, if it you is don't kinda, have a relationship with your daughter, then that's kind of your yeah, fault. Yeah, if she's running around promoting abortion, right. it should occasion some soul searching on your part, I would say. But um as a as a father of daughters, I can say that. But um so anyway, so she comes to DC, speaking of relationships, how and she's chosen by Joe Biden, who has promised America to give that's what we really want, which is a female black vice president. Well, they totally rejected it during the campaign, when her failed presidential campaign, when she thought she, she was launching this historic future forward looking campaign in 2019, in January of 2019, when she announces her run for president. Um, it doesn't go well. And, it, and it, it goes really badly, and I'm sorry to elide right, right over that. So she announces, how long does she run for president? She's remember. one of the first out of the gate. She has all the support from many of the donors, many of the major media elites. You know, she has this moment with people like Rachel Maddow who says, you know, I do think that you are one of our strongest candidates, and I do think that you're going to make it to the final finishing line. 
It's really an, an impressive effort by the elite in the entire party. They want to see Kamala Harris succeed, and they're very bullish about her chances when she gets into the race. It's such a funny, funny race. So the 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 candidate that Democrats really want is the socialist, but he criticizes the banks, so he cannot be allowed to be the nominee because you can't criticize banks. Right. That's immoral, criticizing right. banking. And we're a little squeamish about <laughs> you know, universal health care, right? right? But Kamala Harris— We don't actually want to give Democratic voters anything they really want. Right. So, so when she runs Bernie. as this, uh, you know, she moves herself so far to the left right before she runs for president, she's become this, like, radical leftist candidate, even more radical than Bernie Sanders himself. She endorses Medicare for all, but when she's up on the debate stage and they're like— but if you have Medicare for all, and this means getting rid of private health care, and she's like, that's right, I agree. And then when she gets enormous pushback, media coverage, the health insurance industry, uh, then she walks it back and says, well, actually, I don't mean that. Um, I'm sure private insurance will still be around, and I want it to be around, even though there is socialized health care. Well, that's not really how it works, but <laughs> <laughs> if you if you you know can pivot quickly to say that, and then she makes the same mistake again. And this is when, you know, you obviously have a core Democratic Party that wants to see you as like this leftist champion like Bernie Sanders is, right? right. Kamala Harris really wants to be that figure and is doing her most desperate attempt to win sort of the Bernie Sanders mantle. But the Bernie Sanders supporters are very angry with her for even pretending to be a socialist, Democratic socialist, right? Because she's not. And so I think that there was a very... Well, she's a tool of the banks. Right. And the neocons and every other sort of evil institution in Democratic Party land. Well, she's willing to do the bidding of anybody who can get her in power. She's not... She was never known in California as someone who was... You know, she talks about this... We keep going back. I'm sorry. But uh, she talks how much about how she fought the big banks to win this massive mortgage settlement after... <laughs> After the disastrous 2008 crash, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, what she didn't lead the charge. It was led by Eric Schneiderman from New York, who sort of rallied any progressive attorney general of a state. Many who have gone on to have successful political careers and be like, "This is our moment. If we fight the big banks and earn a bigger settlement, then we are automatically seen as champions." And so she fought the big banks and got a bigger settlement, but she still settled. And well, she's a tool of the rich. I right. mean, it has been always the the banking industry, the abortion industry, the war industry. It, she's she's a little foot soldier for industry. I mean, that's right. she always has been, right? Right. And activists have all been very frustrated with her unwillingness to take risks until she's running for president. And then she's suddenly for everything. Uh, she's for reducing red meat consumption. She's for banning plastic straws. She's for decriminalizing prostitution, despite her mixed record on that. She's for legalizing marijuana. Um, she just totally pivots and becomes this, this figure who supports every single radical agenda item during the Democratic primary. And yet, well, somehow, I think it's, well, that makes resonate. sense as a feminist, because if obviously for, for women, you want to encourage them to sell their bodies like slaves. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently, this is, you go on. You know, black needed to sell this as uh -huh. as something Liberation. that you want. Yeah, something about freedom. We need we what need you need is decriminalization of prostitution and <laughs> and abortion to sell make more yourself. weed, kill your children, and, and smoke more weed. <laughs> and that's about freedom. That's about oh, success. So, that's so that's great. the that's the opportunity economy that we want to sell. Yeah, that's the agenda of the goddess. Um. So her her presidential campaign, despite vigorous endorsement from white ladies like Rachel Maddow crashes and burns. Like, right. the dogs won't eat the dog food, correct? Right. How she goes to it? Iowa. Once she hits Iowa, so her whole life, she's lived in a, in a one-party state, California. And the idea there is to get the backing of the elites, the donors, and then raise enough money to, to just plaster the air with advertising. Right. Then you win. And right. as long as you have the blessing of the elites, then right. you can pretty much win. In California, you don't have to necessarily go on the ground and convince voters. Um, you just need those three things. And so she goes into this primary in Iowa with sort of the, the same focus, right? Win the blessing of the elites, 
raise a bunch of money, run all the advertisements. Mm -hmm. And then when she hits the ground in Iowa, she suddenly finds that Democrats are not. They're, they're willing to listen, but when they listen to her, they're not satisfied with what they're hearing. They see her on the debate stages making the case for all of these progressive policies, but then when she's asked to defend them, she's either walking back or changing her mind on these issues. On top of it all, in the beginning, very beginning of her campaign is when the Jussie, the Jussie Smollett stuff breaks. And that's when she sort of rushes to his defense and is is the first candidate sort of leading the march for justice for Jesse. <laughs> so she sends is, out a tweet. It's, it's like, wait, hold on. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> so here you are making fun of her. She's totally fake. But in one sense, she is a legitimate pioneer. She was the first across the, not the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but the Jesse Smollett Bridge. Like she right. was there right. facing off the guard dogs and fire hoses on behalf of Jesse Smollett. Right. Right. She was lead, she led the entire Democratic primary field to defend Jesse Smollett. <laughs> and then she still hasn't apologized for that, by the way. So she she still like, hasn't taken so down the tweet. She is, in some sense, a civil rights hero, if you define civil rights as, like, fake hate crimes. Right. Yeah. Right. So— uh, And she's never apologized for that? No, she's never apologized for it. She expressed regret that it happened, but she never— Apologize for was it passive constructive construction yeah, it was like very that, much that it yeah. happened yeah <laughs> yeah like this is not spontaneous combustion basically that just like happened. this is not good for people who have real hate crimes so mm. but she still has the tweet defending him as one of the smartest that's bravest. still up that's still up just like her you know the the famous Minnesota bailout of the protesters in Minneapolis yeah yeah that's still live too so she's not she's not one to apologize very much I don't know. It happens with a lot of politicians. Certainly Joe Biden doesn't like to apologize for anything. Yeah, it's it's so telling. Whereas, you know, if you want to be strong, apology is the only way. Right. And people saw her as like the anti-Biden. So when yeah. she first goes out on the debate stage and basically calls him a racist, when they ask him about the accusations of women of unwanted touching and groping, she says, I believe all women. And they have the right to say that. So she's one of the first ones to sort of tackle Biden as this out-of-touch dinosaur who no longer belongs on the national stage. She said as much during the debate, you know, trying to be nice. I'm not calling you a racist, but let me call you a racist. That's if essentially what she said. Because he wasn't enthusiastic enough about busing? Yeah, they. she pulled that from Biden's past, but at the same time, he's out there talking about the good old days when he worked with segregationists and everybody got along. And certainly the modern left was like, well, you can't do that. We don't want that. We don't want Joe Biden. Busing was a disaster. It didn't help anybody. It crushed white kids. It crushed black kids. It destroyed public schools in the United States. I'd love to hear someone explain why busing was a good idea. Right. And like, they, in what sense was it a good idea? Like, how? where did that work exactly? And give me the numbers to show that it worked. It didn't work. It was horrible. And the people who promoted it sent their own children to private school. So, like... I don't know. The fact that she got up there on stage and yelled at Biden, who's a pig, I'm not defending Biden, but like the one place he's been right in his career was to oppose busing. Busing was immoral as hell. And nobody called her on it. It was weird. What was weird is that she was projecting herself as somehow this victim of segregation and and suffrage <laughs> uh, growing up in Berkeley, California. And growing up in Montreal. I mean, that's where she and went to high school. That's was, where she went to high school. Was she, was, was there know, a lot of segregation That famous in moment, that little girl was me. Oh, you know, talking about riding the bus from one wealthy California enclave to another, right? It's, and trying to embrace this idea that she was somehow this great civil rights figure. It was rather offensive to a lot of black people who were just like, Well, no, it's just insane. Good. What about white people? I mean, the whole thing is nuts. The idea that, uh, whatever, without even getting into busing. But I would just love to hear someone defend busing on its own terms. Like, where was busing a success? Who benefited from it exactly? Right, and when they asked her, well, what's your position on busing? She, she found herself unable to explain. Yeah. And they really like, well, what, what, why are we talking about busing anyway? Right? It was just, it was it was an attempt to just find any cudgel at all to hit Joe Biden. No, it's with. totally right. It made a big splash. Did in she the really say that? Why are we talking about it in the first place? No, that's what I'm saying. But oh, she exactly. did, when they asked her for her position on busing, she's like, well, I don't know. Like, she didn't have a good answer of what, how, whether or not she would support federal busing. Gosh, this is really... You don't have to... <laughs> it was such an obvious political attack. Well, right? but you don't even need to 
try that hard to expose her. She exposes herself. It's also fake. A lot of bad things going on in the world that honestly not many of us can have an effect on. Rising crime, failing schools, a tanking economy. What can you do about that? Well, not a lot, but you can get your own house in order. And above all, you can spend money with merchants, with companies that support your values, that are making this a better country and not a worse country. But how do you find those companies? Well, that's where Public Square comes in. Public Square actively curates the best products from America's small businesses to help families lead happier, healthier, more productive, and connected lives. That means fewer errands to big box stores, less searching to find wholesome alternatives to the garbage being offered in our culture, and more quality time spent with the people you love most. If you want to fix your country, you've got to strengthen yourself and your home, and you need to spend your dollars where they do good and not bad. Rebuilding America takes place one small change at a time with wise spending, supporting people who support your family, not funding people who hate you. So if you want to do that, publicsquare.com is the answer. Publicsquare.com. Was she ever popular in California? Did you ever find evidence that she was like had majority support? She was widely in the state? accepted. She won her elections pretty handily, except for the the one race she had problems with was running through um the district, the attorney general's race, there was a formidable Republican still in the state, Steve Cooley, yeah. who posed a pretty big threat. But did she, when, I've often heard people say, but I've never checked it myself, that when she ran for president, she did not have anywhere near majority support in her own state. Right. That is was, that correct? That, one, that was the big problem, is that she thought she could use California as a springboard. Like, obviously, they will rally around me in California and push me forward as the next great leader of the, of the Democratic Party. But people in California did not. She was so low in the polls in California, she had to quit before she got to the California primary because they obviously favored Bernie. Yeah. Well, Bernie's not allowed because the donors didn't like Bernie. Right. There was, there, there was that. Well, and then the biggest, I think the, the moment that was critical for her campaign, she was still kind of limping along even after the Biden attack. Some people liked it, some people didn't, and most, you know, and more, more importantly, the the people who were really in charge of the party and who was going to win were not happy with the... And I think that's kind of why she pulled back. Like, with Biden's record, and if you're a Democrat, a young, rising Democrat, and if you really want to take out Joe Biden, if you go at him hard for about four or five months on his record, you can pretty much turn the entire... I think you could have turned the entire party against him. But because he was sort of seen as maybe the only one who could defeat Donald Trump, I think that there was a lot of force from the establishment Democratic Party that's like, look, just leave him alone. He might be what we need. Don't it's just crazy that the anti-white party in the end nominated an old straight white guy. Right. Blowing past Out of a the- position of fear, right? Because the fake black lady, the gay guy who may not even really be gay. I don't really know, but- a guy who claims he's gay mm -hmm. anyway, and they pick, you know, a 76-year-old straight white guy? Really? <laughs> With all this baggage and history of Democrats' past, right? It's like... Yeah, it's just interesting. So... Oh, the moment that effectively ends her campaign, as I was saying, is the moment that Tulsi Gabbard had the courage to get on stage and call her out as a fake progressive. Yeah, as a warmonger. Right. And uh, I think that really deep sixed her campaign and crushed her. She was ne never able to recover from that. She, there was several attempts at reboots. Um, you know, at one point standing for censorship of President Trump on Twitter, so that somehow she was going to leverage her entire political reboot on this idea of censoring President Donald Trump or even progressives like Elizabeth Warren were like, what are you doing? How is that this even legal? This doesn't even make any sense. Aren't she, weren't she the attorney general? You're supposed to be a... a she, I think she, you're supposed to support free speech as part of the Constitution. Yeah. Right? But at the same time, she she delivered a speech at the NAACP that said, I will increase the number of attorneys at the Department of Justice to go after hate speech and misinformation on social media. And these social media companies better be very afraid for what I want to do. Yeah, don't give up like your we guns. need to hold them responsible for everything that's posted on there. Yeah, for criticizing us, it shouldn't be. Right allowed. How do people like that, who aren't even meaningfully attached to this country in any way or understand what it is, how do they get positions of power? I don't understand. Like, how could someone like Kamala Harris, who 
obviously doesn't like the United States, but doesn't even really understand it. Like she gets to administer our laws. There's something wrong with our system, don't you think? Right. I think it's very much focused on how can we find a willing participant to do everything we say and say and be willing to be flexible on a number of different issues. Someone who doesn't have any core values is easier to manip- easier to manipulate. Yeah. And I think that they saw her as somebody, which is part of the reason why they chose her as vice president. This is someone who obviously has the support of the biggest donors, who also has been out in the streets during the George Floyd protests, um, you know, backing the idea of these protests. And what better person to be President Biden's running mate than the person who accused him of being a racist? Than the lady from the <laughs> HR department, which is what she really right, is. Right, bring her in to, and that's sort of what she, that was sort of how she leveraged her way into the front of the pack, right? It was during the entire Black Lives Matter, George Floyd protests of 2020 that tore up the entire country. And I think that many in the Democratic Party thought that she was necessary to tack on to Biden, who clearly had his problems during the debates on is- on black issues, you know, suggesting to to black families that if they didn't play the record player at night, they were raising their children wrong and telling all these bizarre stories of, you know, relationships with black people and were just totally out of touch. So I, th- I do think they felt that they needed to put the Obama coalition back together in or- if he was g- going to have a chance of winning. And in order to do that, you need a person of color on the ticket. Yeah, I think that's like the um, rich white liberal way of understanding black people. Right, right. And I bet you money that Biden in the end will wind up doing better with black voters than Kamala Harris. I bet you, I bet you money. I mean, I, I'm off it. It clearly right. was in South Carolina, right? When he won all the black vote in South Carolina. Well, yeah, because of Jim Clyburn. He became the nominee after South Carolina and they found out that, you know, black people actually like him and will vote for him, then it was like time to clear the field. Uh, and I get that. Right. And I bet he you- He was the vice president for the first black president. And Well, her- yeah, but he's just also, he, he's a little bit slightly more authentic than her. Like she's so obviously fake. Right. But what do I know? Um, I do know that she's Rachel Maddow's version of a black candidate. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? But anyway, um, so, okay, so she gets chosen by Biden. Was there any, jog my memory, real contest? Were there other people under consideration? To- right, because he famously came out when he's trying to seal the deal with Bernie. He comes out during a debate in the spring saying, I will choose a woman vice president. Mm-hmm. And got a little splash. Nobody remembers the substance of the debate, just that headline, right? Yeah. And then it became, you know, as he's exploring the idea, like, who, that, you know, there's a number of women he really liked, but certainly um, on the top of the list were some of these sort of, um, these figures like Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, who he felt was kind of this, this fun rising power in Michigan who was kind of populist when she ran for office and kind of had this idea of fixing the damn roads. You know, that's just music to the ears of this this future president that just wants to fix in- infrastructure. That's one of his biggest issues. So he's certainly attracted by her. Amy Klobuchar was also someone else that he was interested in bringing on board, someone who he thought would be good. But it became very clear that, and in certainly his campaign advisors as well, um, believe that, no, it's not just enough to have a woman on the ticket. We need a woman of color on the ticket. Because if you look back at Hillary Clinton, she lost a lot of the black vote because she chose- of color, by the way? Right. It's uh, dependent on the people that vote for Democrats. Right. A big part of their... So I feel like he really wanted to pick a Gretchen Whitmer or an Amy Klobuchar. And certainly the Biden family was not happy with the idea of Kamala Harris as vice president. He's the She's the one that actually came out and attacked him for being a racist. So when it became clear... If you remember Hillary Clinton, she chose Tim Kaine, who one of the most vanilla people in the Senate, as her running mate, and she also lost a lot of the black vote. So the smart people, consultants in Washington, are saying the times demand that we choose a woman of color, a black woman. God, they are the dumbest people I've ever met. Um, so Biden looks at this, these options, and he has 
on his top of the list as he's heading into it, it's Kamala Harris, Susan Rice, who he has a good relationship with from mm-hmm. when his time in the Biden administration or in the Obama administration. And um, so those are sort of his top two picks. And the fact that Susan Rice is even being considered seriously shows that she was that, you know, they do not want Kamala. Susan Rice was Jill's favorite, but ultimately between his conversations with his donors, with his advisors, and certainly with Obama himself, he was urged to sort of put the past behind him and choose Kamala Harris. And so it's interesting. Should- I know Susan Rice pretty well, and I think she's a scary person who, who's motivated basically by hate, but she's capable. She's a real person. Right. Kamala Harris is not a real person. It's totally fraudulent just DEI pick, but Susan Rice is not. And Susan Rice is a pretty serious person. And like, if you had- It a, might have been difficult to run a campaign with Susan Rice, right? I don't I feel know. like she may I, I've have. always been kind of impressed by Susan Rice, even though I fear Susan Rice. And I think, right. I don't think she's a particularly good person, but I I definitely have some respect for Susan Rice. Mm-hmm. Um, she was my neighbor for years. Oh, and, really? Yeah. yeah. I, you know, for, for any- conservative, they would see Susan Rice as the face of Benghazi, and why would you ever want that? Well, the whole Benghazi story was bullshit in the first place, right. and the amount of lying by conservative media about Benghazi en- enrages me. The point of Benghazi was they were moving weapons from Gaddafi's weapon stockpiles to Syria to fight an undeclared war that only hurt the United States, and those a lot of those weapons are going to Islamic extremist groups. And that was the actual story. And that was suppressed because the neocons didn't want to talk about that. Wow. And I just sat in, in rage for years watching this Benghazi. I mean, the Benghazi story was real. Right. People but died. The it reason was true for tragedy. It. But right. no one was allowed to ask, well, like, what were all those CIA officers there doing was, in Benghazi in the yeah, first place? There was, I think it was Rand Paul, who was sort of the only one. Who Did you ever hear anyone on. ask, like, what was yeah. that? Wait, wait a second. Okay. Why? Yeah. yeah. I, Fascinating. I, just Fascinating. as someone from D.C., I'm right. like, wait a second. Why were there that many CIA personnel in this one town? Huh. And I remember asking that myself on television and having a producer say to me, that's not really the story. And I was like, well, actually, I think it is the story. <laughs> it's part of the story anyway. It's the context right. of the story. Right. Sorry, I've been mad about this for a decade. No, I'm I'm only saying that uh, I'm not Susan endor- Rice. Right. I'm not endorsing anything that Susan Rice has ever done. I think Susan Rice is one of the reasons that the country is so screwed up right now. Mm-hmm. All I'm saying is, if your job is to run the government, you don't want to pick someone who's like, like pathetic, like Kamala Harris, who's not done a single thing in her entire life. Right. And is just clearly not a capable person, can't make a decision, doesn't have a clear vision. Doesn't have much experience, had never done anything. Like, even Obama delivered a great speech that everybody thought was the, yeah, had Obama's, healed the nation. Obama's he was a, a he was talented a, guy. He was a figure, right? Kamala Harris was never a figure. Exactly. And, uh, I mean, Susan They Rice, really wanted her to be. They they started by calling her the It's female. just your classic rich, white, liberal view of the world. It only, all right. that matters is your skin color. right. It's not so different from the segregationist view of the world, which they also supported. You know, their parents supported in the Democratic mm-hmm. Party. It's just like all that matters is what color you are. Anyway, whatever. Don't get me going. But um, okay, so they pick her. What's her relation? You say Jill Biden was actually for Susan Rice. Right. What is the relationship between Kamala and the Bidens once she gets chosen? So I really think that Joe Biden felt that he could, that Kamala would be his buddy. He really wanted a buddy vice president. And he really yeah. thought Kamala could rise to the occasion and learn how to be a good vice president. Because he had been a vice president. Yes. He knew what it took. For like, eight years. For everything yeah. you can say about Joe Biden, he was very deferential to the president. And he was very loyal to him and worked very hard. Like Obama's not sort of... Uh, a warm, glowing figure that wants to be friends with everybody. Yes. He's, he's, and But Biden sort of wormed his way into a buddy-type relationship with Obama. And they actually got along pretty well when they were in office, despite, you know, obvious frictions between the two camps. That always happens. But I think that he th- thought that Kamala Harris would sort of drop everything and become wholly united to his vision and his campaign but they found out very soon after they took office that no, Kamala Harris had no interest in being Joe Biden's buddy, 
had no interest in taking hard issues off his plate or defending him. I think it was very clear from the moment she got into office, she was here for the next step in her career, and she was going to do everything possible to sort of preserve her political future and not waste it on <laughs> this aging Joe Biden, who is clearly on his way out. It Nicely sounds- put, Charlie. <laughs> Wait, so you're saying that Joe Biden picked a ruthless careerist loyal to no one but herself right. and was shocked to discover that she was a ruthless careerist loyal right. to no one but herself. And someone who was not competent. To be- <laughs> <laughs> and she's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Do you think they were really surprised by that? I think so. I think I think Biden really thought that she would rise to the occasion and, and realize the nature of the job. Well, he was senile then, huh? Yeah, I guess so. Um, but yeah, it became very clear that she was not there to help him. She was there to the next step in her career. And she kind of has this, kind of has this, this, this kind of aspect goes back throughout her entire career, right? She she rises with Willie Brown, and then when Willie Brown leaves office, she kicks him under the bus, um, basically saying, if he d- commits any crimes, I'm going to throw him in jail. And you sort of kicks him under the bus as someone that's no longer politically relevant, right? She said that? Yeah. When she's running for district attorney, everyone, that's all people wanted to talk about. This is... This is the woman who dated Willie Brown. She's obviously corrupt. And she's like, no, Willie Brown, I'm done with him. He has no influence on me, even though he's behind the scenes raising money for her. She essentially throws Willie Brown under the bus. I don't think it's a good idea to date Kamala Harris. I'm, that's that's the picture that's emerging. Right, right. Do, do you agree with that? Certainly not in her early career. No. And she didn't eventually- I just want people listening to this to remember, do not date Kamala Harris. Unless you're Doug Emhoff, and then perhaps <laughs> you can get remarried to a 50-year-old woman mm-hmm. and uh, who has a career path into national politics. Well, he's maybe. pretty tough on the ladies, though. I mean, he's, he runs a tight ship. He'll, runs he'll, tight sma- ship. he'll smack you in the valet line if you get mouthy. There's been it. some great reporting at the Daily <laughs> Mail about that. Uh, I'm so, sorry, I'm getting ahead <laughs> of the story. So, so, so Joe Biden— right thinks that Kamala Harris is going to be his little friend. Right. His little black friend, actually. <laughs> his cool black or friend. Or certainly a supportive, <laughs> supportive, a supportive force to sort of ease up all the tension he's getting from women and, and black people. Maybe uh-huh. Kamala will help. Trying to make the ladies settle down. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So um, he really, because exp- Obama did this to Biden, right? He Anytime he had a thorny issue, he'd be like, I'm going to put Sheriff Joe in charge of this and he's going to take care of it. And Biden realized what Obama was doing, but he just sort of grinned and be like, yep, I'm the vice president. This is what we do. Um, so right away, the first thing for Kamala Harris, it's like, we need you to take a thorny issue off our plate. We're going to put you in charge of immigration. And we all saw how that went, right? And yeah. she was very adamant about, I'm not in charge of immigration. I'm not the immigration czar. I'm only in charge of root causes in the Northern Triangle. He was very adamant about that. Even correcting Joe Biden behind the scenes when he's in Congress, he's like, and Kamala is going to take care of the immigration problem. And she would be like, actually, no, Mr. President, I am only handling the root causes of immigration. Maybe it's Mayorkas or or somebody else that's actually going to handle the immigration problem for you because that's not my job. But, you know, now we have this whole thing, like she was never the border czar. But she was in charge of the messaging on immigration when she made her trip to Guatemala and told migrants, do not come. If if you come, I believe you will be sent away. Well, we all saw how effective that messaging was. So it's it's very clear that the the administration really wanted to take her to take this issue off the plate to be the messenger on immigration, and she sort of wriggled out of that assignment. Ultimately, you know, did she succeed at any aspect of the root causes? I think they might have some metrics to say she did. But did she fix Mexico? She certainly didn't fin- oh, okay. fix any root causes as we know it. It's also absurd. Um, and root causes is always a dodge. Not that there aren't root causes; there are. But whenever you see a politician pivot from well, let's get to the, the problem <laughs> right. to its root causes, you realize that politician is just punting. Right. Yeah. So what was, um, in the end, Joe and Jill Biden's view of Kamala Harris? 
disappointment, I think. I think they really hoped she would rise to the occasion. Well, um, there's reporting done that, you know, Joe Biden said that she was work in progress just a few months ago. Mm-hmm. He still believes that she was making her way, but probably hadn't have risen and seized the the imaginations of the American public as well as they had hoped as being this sort of transformational figure, historic figure, right? Like, how can you not just instantly become an American icon? Yeah. But with Kamala Harris, it was a very big struggle. (laughs) American (laughs) icon. (laughs) Certainly Obama was an American icon, Mm. right? Yeah. but uh, She's a member of the master race, so we have to worship her. But no, that's not how it really works. In, In the end, if I can just restate the obvious, Obama who I think was evil and bad for America, but he was really talented. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it was because he was black. He's just talented. No, it was, he was very talented and very, but it was people like Joe Biden who's like, wow, you know, he was the one on the record calling, you know, praising him for being an articulate black guy. It just shows, exactly. (laughs) It just shows how racist the, the rich white liberal is because all they see in Obama is black. And they're like, oh, we just get some black person in here, someone we can call black. That person will become an American icon. And it's like, no, that's, right. you kind of have to earn it, right? right? And imagine if you're Kamala Harris, right? You're brought into the Democratic Party as this as this, this transformational figure, as this icon. You're, they view you as the female Obama. And it's very insulting, right? Because It's so insulting. It's right. insane. But this, and this happened with Tulsi Gabbard too because if you remember and I she's done a number of great interviews with Rogan with you um where she talks about how when she first got when she was first elected to Congress the Democratic Party immediately brings her into the higher echelons of power not the important ones right but the Which ones was vice chair of the DNC yeah bring her into these positions because she's seen as this obvious person that we need to center our agenda on to show how diverse and how open we are right. to new personalities and new people and how fresh and young and interesting we are. And the minute she diverts from the, she, you know, she talked about this, how she was celebrated by all of course. Democrats. And the minute she diverts from the agenda to warn about war in Syria, which is something she profoundly believes in, war, she's been to war, she does not like war. But the minute she diverts from the agenda, everyone's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Your political career is over. And now we're going to ostracize They, they never listened to what she said. I mean, her views didn't change. No. She believed that when she got elected from Hawaii. But all they saw was the way she looked. Right. Because they're racist and they judge people on the basis of their race. That's the definition of racist. And they saw her and they're like, oh, she's not white. Therefore, she's great. And they never heard a word she uttered. Even when she ran for president, they just ignored her. Well, by that point, they hated her because they they finally picked up on the fact that she was against their whole agenda. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But And and she took out one of their star their star people. Well, she's tough. Yeah. And she's great. She's genuine. She believes in things. She's not fake tough like Kamala Harris, right? Yeah. It's like on the verge of tears when Brett Bayer asked her a question. It's like, oh my gosh. Um So Jill Biden is very famous in D.C. This is a product of my reporting from living down the street from her um, as like a real bitch, as someone who's, you know, tough and nasty. And I always have- Tough girl from Philly. And she's on the record saying, I am willing to forget the attacks, but I will never forgive. Yeah. I mean, she's that, I mean, that's certainly, you know, her reputation in D.C. over the- 35 years I lived in the same city as her, she was definitely regarded as a bitch. So I always wondered, how did she get along with Kamala Harris? Now, I don't think they ever got along. I think, and it was very clear in events, they they say the things like, we're so proud of you. Thank you, Kamala. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, When she was selected, you know, Jill Biden was there to offer cookies and pretend that everything's normal. But yeah, you don't forget those kinds of attacks against your husband. And, but good for her, by the way. I'm on I'm on Dr. Jill's side on that one. Right. Like you're obviously part of have been in politics for a very long time. So you're used to people attacking your husband. And certainly with Joe Biden, he was attacked for he always wanted to be president and he was always pushed aside by the elites. So she did have a chip on her shoulder. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. And even Joe Biden himself. I mean, when they finally reached this position, 
They are people who were repeatedly thrust out of the conversation and pushed aside and mocked and belittled until they needed him. And so, oh, but wait, you get four years and then it's time for you to go. We're done with you. So what happened? I mean, this just happened this summer. Yeah. But it's maybe because it did just happen. It's hard to understand exactly what that was. Um, what, like, what do you think that was? And did Kamala Harris have a role? I assume she had a role in pushing Biden out, of course. Right. The official narrative is that, you know, she woke up one morning and had pancakes and bacon with her nieces and was working on a puzzle. And Joe Biden called her out of the blue and said, I'm getting out of the race and I'm going to endorse you for president. And then she jumped and got on the phone. And within 12 hours on the phone, she wrapped up the entire nomination. That's the story? That's the official story. Is it actually? Yeah. So this that is she the- She single-handedly the- got on the phone eating anchovy pizza and sweats, wearing her sweats, and made it enough phone calls to where she could wrap up the entire nomination in, in a day. So this is the Soviet That's Union the at official. This point, That's the official. They just narrative. tell lies that are so absurd. <laughs> they know we're not going to believe them, but they don't care. Right. They have actually, I'm, I missed all this. They, that was a story they that's told. That's sort of the official story. Well, that's just Soviet. I mean, that's just absolutely crazy. Yeah. So, but we know for three weeks, maybe four, from from after the debate in June to the day that Joe Biden announced that he was stepping down. There was a furious amount of activity behind the scenes. Pelosi, Schumer. And you know that Kamala Harris has to publicly backing Joe the whole way. But what are her people doing behind the scenes? Is there no effort to sort of make sure that you're being considered? (laughs) Come on. To be his heir, which is your rightful position? These are politicians. Politics is what they do. Right. I mean, that's why they got into this. That's how their brains work there's people behind you who are working. Of course. Like, of course you can claim deniability. I was doing nothing. Yeah. Like, there's no, people it's... who support you, who ten, who will get power from you if you are elected that are working on your behalf. That just happens organically out of, out of our political system, right? It's been going on for generations. So you have to imagine that there was always going to be this, this idea that there might be an actual convention where we go and choose the candidate that we want. There might be it's, a democratic it's like a, process. It's like a, yeah, like a democratic process. What do they call it? A brokered convention? Yeah, or democracy, I think they call I think, it. Yeah, something like that. Because it's yeah. so fragile. So very fragile, but so very strong. <laughs> well, it obviously doesn't exist. <laughs> if your presidential candidate gets the job without anyone voting on it, then that you don't have democracy. Right. So I think that Pelosi and people did want to see a choice because yep. they th- had hoped that the strongest candidate would emerge. I think a lot of the reason why Biden ran for re-election in the first place is because he and many in the Democratic Party, and certainly in 2023, nobody thought that Kamala Harris could win a race for president against Donald Trump. Not even win a primary. and They just didn't think no. she was ready. Right. And that's what's so fascinating. Like, when I published the book... A lot of what I was, re- you know, reporting and researching was 23 in, in D.C. when they, when Washington, Washington D.C. had thoroughly rejected her, and we're even having conversations of why not get rid of her entirely on the ticket? We need somebody else if Joe Biden's going to win yeah. again. So that we went from there. I mean, Washington's cruel, right? You, you show up and you are not ready, and you make mistakes, as she clearly did during her first three three years, and that's pretty well chronicled then they turn on you. They don't see you as valuable. And they had officially, most of Washington thought she was a complete joke. She didn't have, you know, there's not like these these defenders or people who actually want to see you succeed in Washington. They're all rooting for your failure and they only respect you if you prove them wrong. And Kamala Harris clearly wasn't proving them wrong at this point in 23. So when she's ultimately kept on the ticket, it's for obvious reasons. Like we can't just kick her aside and and bring Gretchen Whitmer in to save the day to run with Joe Biden. Right. It's tough. Yeah. It's tough. You're you're beheld by the same identity politics that you embrace to get her to this position. Oh yes. You're hung by your own petard. Yes, that is um I mean it was it was obvious this was gonna happen. I wasn't surprised at all. I was a little surprised um that she picked Tim Walls 
if you want a gay guy, why not just go with Pete Buttigieg? <laughs> what what was the thinking there? Um, I don't know too much other than what's been reported, right? It's just that ultimately she selected Tim Wall. She had a prior relationship. In fact, Tim Walls first appeared on the campaign trail when she went to Minnesota to visit a Planned Parenthood clinic for being the historic first <laughs> vice president to actually campaign at a Planned Parenthood clinic. At an abortion Tim clinic. Tim Walls was right there cheering her on. Kind of wholesome, uplifting deal. Right. Like, this is what we're These for. These are totally normal people. Right. And so I think that she met him there and at various points in her career and found him to be an entertaining figure, <laughs> likable figure, <laughs> entertaining right? Entertaining figure. You know, we met at an abortion clinic and- uh, Got along real well. He seemed kind of fussy and bubbly. And so I thought I would pick him. Yeah. They actually met at an abortion clinic. I don't know if that's the first time, but that was definitely a pivotal moment, right? It was like- <laughs> This is- I don't know what, Okay. Um, wow. I didn't know that. That's- It's one of the first times you see Tim Walls on camera, which I didn't recognize him at the time, but going back and looking at- her speech is there. He's right behind her, clapping the whole time. So, I, you know, you assess people by what they do, but also by their relationships. Who are they close to? Mm -hmm. And in her case, I'm looking at the men in her life, and I see, well, obviously, Montel Williams and Willie Brown. Um, right. I know both of them. Um, I like them both better than the men currently in her life. But the men now in her life would be her dad, mm -hmm. who is not in her life. Not in her life. Writing an op-ed attacking her, not invited to her own inaugural you see tim walls who is you know i guess her little gay friend or whatever but creepy guy they hang out at abortion clinics together and then you see her husband the nanny impregnator who smacked a woman in the face um what is that right when I did the reporting for the book, and, and I certainly did not pick up on this, but in Washington at the time, he was widely celebrated, widely liked. They ooh, really, ooh, people, in Washington, people in Washington, D.C. really liked Doug Emhoff. They thought he was this gregarious, fun well, character. Actually, he looks like it, actually. loved being in power and was just like Big golfer. Doing, doing yeah. the best he could to back up Kamala Harris. And he would go, do all these panels about how his number one job was to, you know, defend this idea of of having a strong woman in office. Well, they love the beta male. <laughs> and it's always the beta male is punching women in the face, but whatever. Uh, yeah. But where did she meet him? Unfortunate. What is that? They met, uh, but right, I think it was right as she ran, right after she won her second term. Well, it would have been in 2014. But right as she's getting ready to go national. And she talks about in her book how it, it wasn't easy to be a political figure being a single woman. Talks about how she was treated differently and how it was a struggle. So I do think ultimately she, you know, I'm sure they had a great dating relationship and that they they found enough in common to where they felt that, you know, it was worth pursuing. Do you marriage. think she let him smack her around? I don't see that. No. Yeah. I think Doug's been sufficiently... Tamed. Kept in his place. Yeah. yeah he's been tamed by the... Despite all the reporting of who Doug was before, like he has definitely been put in his place and yeah. and realizes his job and he's enjoying the benefits of being a, a, a man who supports strong women. And I think that's why a lot of people, I think that was a step too far for a lot of the people that spoke to the Daily Mail. It's like, no, you are not this. But they all are. Any male feminist has probably hit a woman. I mean, that's the whole point of being a male feminist is right. to hide the fact that you treat women Hide like the that. fact that you're a monster, right? 100%. Obviously. Um, every woman knows that, by the way. If you just ask a woman, who are the men to be afraid of is the one who's always telling you how. Is that right? Oh, of course. Yeah. Any man who describes himself as a feminist is probably a physical danger to you. Yeah, for wow. sure. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm from California, so I've seen this my whole <laughs> and life. And lived in Washington, yes, D.C. for exactly. a very long time. But Emhoff, um, were, did they like publicly date? I, I missed all this. Were they, was it well known that they were dating? Was he a big political figure in California? Who is he? No, he's an entertainment lawyer. Yep. And so he was connected by one of Kamala's friends. And I think that they ended up together because obviously it's a very good in this time of your life to not be a single person. I think yeah. that's, especially if you're pursuing higher office, you don't yeah. want to be a single person and you know, um, and you shouldn't be, it's right. And I'm not saying this in a mean way, just honestly, it, that kind of job is so hard 
If you're you not going to have somebody in your anybody, corner. Oh, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I'm not, I'm, I'm sympathetic to Kamala Harris in that way. For sure. sure. And they very much talk about Doug as being this figure, someone she can come home and vent yeah. to and talk to. And um, even though she made the decision to go basically be the president when he's at Soul Cycle exercising with friends and he doesn't find out until he gets back to his car. Now, he admitted, <laughs> he admitted, he admitted being this. at Soul Cycle with his gay friends. Right? Yeah. That's what he yeah. said. And he said he didn't Did he find it's real. I mean, how could it not? It just. I was. Where else would you be? How can you? You like there? Ha, there has to be obvious evidence of that. You wouldn't make up that story. It's just so unbelievable. Imagine yourself saying that. When my wife got the nod that she was going to run for president, I was at Soul Cycle with my gay friends. And I, I think he said well, that. That's what he said. And then he said, "When I got back to my car, I picked up my phone and called her, and she said, "Where the f have you been?" Man, if one of my college roommates did something like that, I would call him up and say, what are you thinking? <laughs> Seriously, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah. I would say, what? Yeah. You made it. And certainly, yeah. I mean, it seems like she very much made the decision on her own without, you know, time to think about it with friends and family. Maybe they had had this discussion beforehand that if it if she ever got the call, she could just go for it but doesn't sound like isn't much there most politicians like, like well i gotta think about it with friends and family before i make no you gotta talk to your husband right your spouse yeah or least, your wife right? right yeah not friends and family your spouse the person you're married your spouse, to right yeah. right and then your kids they don't have kids she doesn't have kids but but yeah then i guess your friends and family but your spouse is the yeah, first at person least you, you should talk at least to. have a phone call before you accept it but we both should be on the same page or you're not really married, right? Well, obviously. Th this These are obvious things to non-political people. It's not just Kamala Harris. She's not the only one with a uh -huh. fake marriage in politics. Like most of them seem to have those. But um, but I just want to say that out loud because it is really sick. It's not uh -huh. normal. And we should just acknowledge that. So if we remember what normal is. Normal is when you have a marriage, it's a partnership, a full partnership, where if you're going to make a major life decision, you talk it over with your spouse. That's my experience. Well, of course, or else it's not a real marriage. Right. I mean, isn't that the whole point of marriage? I think so. I thought so. Right. Well, it I mean, is. Certainly I would just say I'm, I'm not very familiar with um, sort of the marriages that you're describing. Well, that's just a roommate situation. Yeah. Um, so, Wow. These stories came out in your paper. Can you just describe for maybe people who haven't been reading the Daily Mail? So what are the stories that we've, what have we learned about Doug Emhoff? Right. Um, that he had this relationship with this pretty professional, pretty successful female lawyer and that he struck her in the face when they were at a public event together. And then afterwards he kind of forced his way into her taxi even after the incident and basically was like, well, this is just the product of of our relationship. And, you know, this woman is clearly very upset, very um, frightened by what he's done. But he doesn't necessarily, it's not, let's, it's, there's no attempt to heal or it just seems like it's the product of what happened that night. And he certainly doesn't seem to repented from that, certainly not publicly. Do you, okay, so the, but he, the bottom line is he was dating a woman they're in Cannes, France, south of France, right. at the film festival, but at some AIDS event, as I remember. Yeah. And he hits her in the face, waiting for, out of jealousy, she says, waiting for their car in the valley line. Mm -hmm. I think that's the allegation. Is is it real? I mean, it's October of an election year. Do you believe that's a real story? Certainly. And like the evidence that we've gathered and the, the testimony, you know, the evidence from that night certainly more real than any other accusation we've heard about um, a lot of men politicians recently. Really? Um, can can, can you, you imagine if maybe somebody accused Mike Pence of doing that, right? Would they? Would the media actually care about that? I don't know. Um, that's a whole nother, Mike Pence is a whole nother story, man. I don't know what to think there. But right. um, Or any other... No, no, I, of course. No, I see your right. point that if... If the partisan positions were switched, of course, it would if be. If Donald Trump Jr. Well, was obviously. slapping women in the face, would that right. be a big story? A really hard, spinning her around right. with his hand. Right. So, but when you say testimony, can you tell us what that is? You talk to other people who were there? Well, it wasn't my story at the Daily I Mail. But, it, but yeah, the reporters who worked on the story and the editors who worked on the story um, 
spoke with a lot of witnesses about what had happened, who recall that day, the day that she called them to tell them what happened. And this, you know, corroborated evidence with evidence of the flight ticket. There's certainly enough there. And you had a great conversation with Megyn Kelly, who came away, you know, Megyn Kelly's pretty a sharp lawyer, right? She came away saying, I believe... She's very sharp, yeah. She, it was very interesting to hear her talk about it and say, you know, I believe it all. Because she's, A, experienced these type of men that do these things, and B, um, knows enough to smell whether or not a story is fake. Yeah, it's... I guess so. And who does he go to to sort of wipe it all away? Joe Scarborough from MSNBC. <laughs> that is so funny. And Joe Scarborough. Joe Scarborough is like, well, what about all this stuff in the tabloids? And, and Doug Emhoff just looks him straight in the eyes like, we can't get distracted from our mission here. Oh, so Emhoff never denied it? No. I think his team did in some passive language, but he certainly hasn't, personally. So, but bottom line, you're convinced, and again, you work at the publication that ran this story, that this is a real person mm -hmm. and your reporters. Oh, I've heard people say, oh, we know who this woman is. Like if, if, the, if the mainstream media was actually concerned about validating this story, they could pursue it. Yeah. But as is often the case, when you have an uncomfortable narrative or in the last days of an election... You know, I guess we didn't get censored, right? And we didn't, uh, they didn't call it Russian disinformation and ban no. us from t social media. I think they're trying That's to kind just of, make it go away. They really would like it to go away. Yeah, of course. Right. Which it will. And the I'm, fact that you're talking about it and Megyn Kelly is talking about it is very inconvenient for their campaign. Yeah, you know, it's just, it's, look, I, I just want to be consistent, however. I don't like Doug Emhoff's politics. I feel sorry for him um, just because his life seems depressing, but I don't like his politics. But I also know that there have been a lot of people whose politics I also don't like who've been destroyed by false accusations of sexual harassment, physical abuse. Like there's a lot of falseness around right. Me Too claims, including people I know and um, had one of them on the other day, Mark Alperin. And so I just I just want to be fair. Right. And I'm also really uncomfortable with any accusation from an anonymous source against someone we name. Like, so we, we name the person right. who's been accused, but we don't name the accuser. I just want to say for the record, I think that's immoral. I don't think we should have anonymous accusations, but whatever, it's, it seems very common now. But I just want to make sure that that, um, so you believe this, they know who this is and this seems like a real thing? Right. Yeah. I, I do believe it. And when you have multiple witnesses that are willing to say something, it means that they're deeply upset by what happened. And not only that, they're deeply upset by the person he's being portrayed. As and like they a champion saw it happen. Witnesses, you had you interviewed, your paper interviewed witnesses who saw it happen. I think that they were witnesses who were there, who the woman talked to, right? Wow. The, the woman who, you know, this isn't, uh, this isn't, you know, we can't be too cavalier, but this isn't a Christian Christine Blasey Ford accusation. Yeah. This is something where... Multiple people are and it wasn't corroborated. It wasn't yet. 40 years ago. Right. This is something that happened very recently. Amazing. Do you think that story has penetrated at all? Well, certainly you and Megan have talked about it yeah, a lot. Yeah, but... Which yeah. Has, and Donald Trump made a joke about it. He, well, and not about the violence story, but he made a joke about the nanny story. And during so the, that story uh, is that Emhoff impregnated his nanny. Right. And that that just seems like a fact. He actually addressed it and said that, yes, it happened. Huh. Um, it, has Kamala said anything oh, no, about it? No. And it's very, it's one of those stories, right? You don't ask about that if you ever want to get an interview with Kamala Harris again. That's not something you bring up, right? So certainly a lot of media figures aren't interested in asking about that story. How do you assess the coverage of her? Just kind of meta question here as a reporter, as someone who's really tried to cover Kamala Harris. Yeah, that's what I've kind of, you know, because I remember Obama and I remember how the media was, how they acted during the Obama administration. And if they had actually held him accountable on a few things, then it might have gone better. Yeah. I think as a journalist, you kind of want to just hold people accountable and puncture through like their false narratives, reveal who they really are, kind of expose their weaknesses. Yeah. Warn the American people like this is the type of person that you would vote for. Yeah. 
this is how they act behind the scenes. This yeah. is who they really are. They're, we're not going to let the politician tell their own story. And that's not good for America. That's not good for democracy. You have to know the full story and you have to have impartial people looking into it. But you, but Kamala Harris as a hero of the civil rights movement has a story, has exclusive rights to her own story, right? You don't get to tell her story. Right. And you can write your book. Every politician writes a book before they <laughs> run for a higher office. Look at Ron DeSantis. He published a book telling his whole story. Yeah. But we don't just take the biography and run with it as as the next American icon. They have to earn that. And certainly well, we get to we get to ask questions, don't we? That's our that's what we like to do. I think, yes, yeah. actually uncover interesting things about people that, yeah, and paint a bigger portrait than just the one that's on their campaign ad, their campaign slogan. So I do I do find that very rewarding. I think every journalist should find that rewarding. Like, who is the real Kamala Harris? What does she believe in? Turns out, not much. Um, if there's any issue she's never changed her position on or one issue she actually cares about and can speak passionately about, it's abortion. I think that's her number one. Why do you think she's so, issue. is this someone who never had children? I'm not attacking her. I feel sorry for her. Children are a source of joy, really the only enduring mm -hmm. source of joy. So um, speaking of joy, so I'm, I'm definitely not attacking her for that at all. I feel really bad for her. But why? But it's just interesting that someone who never had kids would be so committed to abortion. Like, what do you think that is? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, it's it's obviously something that she has dealt with. She's obviously had people in her life at, who have dealt with. Has this. she had an abortion? She's never. Has anyone asked her? She's never publicly said anything about it. Why didn't someone ask her? So she's constantly talking about other people's abortions and abortion, 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 abortion. Why is it out of bounds to say, "Hey, have you had an abortion"? Right, because if you had, you would certainly expect that you would be this. You would champion that moment since it's the expression of human Look, freedom. If, if, right? if I'm running around talking about how we need, how you know, abortion subsidized isn't... appendectomies, then I think it's fair to say, have you ever had an appendectomy? Right. If there's nothing to be ashamed of, then why does nobody ask her? I don't get that. I don't. You know, I'm kind of sick of yeah. playing along with all this stuff. I must say, all these weird we taboos have... that only serve one political party, where there's some things you're supposed to talk about, but only in a certain way. Other things you're never allowed to talk about. Certain people have a right to tell their own story. Other people who have no right to talk at all. Like I'm just, who makes these rules, and why are we playing along with them? Right. Has any pro-choice woman who is in political office shared her? experience of having an abortion. Yeah, I mean, I really, just for the record, don't want to hear about other people's abortions or abortion right. at all. It's killing, it's grotesque, but if it is super the, depressing. But if it is the act of ultimate human freedom and you and you campaign on this. Well, they're issue. the ones who are talking about it constantly. So maybe maybe you would consider that this would be. But if Brett Baer had said to her the other night, um, you know, Madam Vice President, have you, ever, you talk about abortion, have you ever had one? I mean, I think he would have been fired from his job for saying right. that. And he certainly would become instantly a villain. And you right. sort of wonder, like, why? why? Right. If there's nothing wrong with abortion, if you're supposed to shout your abortion, or like Tim Walls is very obviously gay. I look at him, and I'm like, well, you're <laughs> gay. And I'm sure I'll be attacked for saying that. Maybe right. he's not gay, but he certainly seems gay. Right. They, and they immediately say, where's your evidence? Oh, I don't have any evidence. I'm just saying right. the guy looks super, super gay to me. But- they're the ones always running around being like, it's great to be gay. Okay, if it's great to be gay, then why is it an attack on him for me to say that? And why would it be out of bounds to be like, hey, Tim Walls, you seem super gay. Are you gay? Have you ever slept with dudes? Like, if you asked that question, you would, you'd be fired I mean, from you're your just, job. You're just asking that now. It's very controversial, right? But why would that be controversial? If there's evidence. nothing wrong with it, right. then why is it so offensive to ask that question? Right. I don't like this doesn't I mean, make any sense. I think ultimately Democrats feel like these issues are very private, which is why they campaign so strong. They're so private, really? Yeah. You've got a, a LGBTQ plus parade in San Francisco, New York, Seattle, every big city in the country, people are having sex in the street. So it's not private. Right. They're telling my kids constantly that it's a good thing. So there's nothing private or forbidden or taboo about it now, right? Just to be clear, those right. are Right, and then rules. you have so Tim Walls. It's ask? like, keep the hell out of my bedroom. We are the we okay, are but, party of privacy. But if and there's for, nothing wrong with being gay, which is certainly a right. position, in fact, it's morally superior to being heterosexual. Obviously, they say that, in effect. If the State Department's pushing it on every country around the world, then why would it be somehow crazy or out of bounds or taboo or offensive for me to say to Tim Walls, you seem gay, it's not an attack. Right. Are you gay? <laughs> what? 
But you know as well as I do that if I had an employer, which I don't, I would immediately be fired for saying right. So, like, what is that? That doesn't make any sense. And why are we playing along with it? That's my that's my point. Yeah. I'm not going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I wouldn't either because I don't really want to know about Tim Walls' sex life. I don't want to know about anyone's sex life. I want to stop talking about our sex lives, actually, immediately. Right. And I want you the State Department to stop the past. forcing right. other people in other countries to talk about their sex lives. I just want to declare a truce on race and sex and abortion. I don't want to hear about your abortion. Right. At all. I don't want you to talk about abortion. Shut up about abortion, about your sex life, mm -hmm. about your race. That's the world that I want to live in. But they're not allowing me to live in that world. So as long as they're not allowing me to live in that world, why am I playing along with rules that are rigged against me? Right. Uh, these are fair questions, right? So why don't you ask Tim, why don't you ask Tim Walls that question? About abortion? No, no. Just say, hey, Tim Walls, <laughs> you seem gay. I'm not attacking <laughs> you, but I've seen the video of you doing jazz hands. Yeah. Are you gay? Have you ever had sex with a man? I don't know if I would. I don't know if I would have enough evidence to make that. Question no, no, no. Reality, just, just like right? that. It just seems that way. Uh -huh. It's kind of my impression. Yeah. Are you gay? Would but that would that would go badly for you, wouldn't it? Right. I, I would never. I would never ask that question. <laughs> Not just, all of us have the the freedom to ask that question, no, I'm just or pointing. the same like interest in that question right well, i don't have the, any yeah. interest in it he's the one who's constantly he's the one who ran a gay straight alliance where he's talking to children about their sex lives um, so right that. there that's a criminal yeah. offense in my book okay. you don't get to talk to other people's kids about their sex lives period yeah. freak right but there he's bragging about it okay mm -hmm. you know why am i barking at you charlie don't mean to bark at you <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Just trying to be rational for a yeah, second. Yeah, it makes sense. You know, when you when you look at the what our media has become, and when you wonder, when you look at the questions that they ask when they get the privilege, you know, interviewing a presidential candidate is now a privilege right. bestowed on you, and you have to demonstrate that you're worthy on a number of issues. Right, the first person that got an interview with Kamala Harris was the woman from MSNBC who publicly said she didn't need to do interviews, and then suddenly she gets an interview. So that's what our <laughs> that's what our media has become, and, right? So, so you're you're filling me in on so much that I've missed. Who at MSNBC said that Kamala Harris didn't need to do interviews? Uh, Stephanie Rule. Stephanie Rule. She was on Bill Maher and said Kamala Harris doesn't need to do interviews because she, it's so obvious that. Donald Trump is the worst and that she's the best. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. But Stephanie that was... Rule, the perky business reporter? From MSNBC? Yeah, she was a business reporter last really? I checked. I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, she was the first one to ask. She was the first one to get a major... Well, I guess Dana Bash got the first one, right? With uh, Tim Walls and Kamala Harris. But Stephanie Rule got the first solo sit-down with Kamala Harris. I think that's true. And yeah, she publicly said on Bill Maher that why does she even need to do media when it's very obvious that she's the best candidate compared to Trump. Wow. That's crazy. Right. She's just so great. We don't need to talk to her. That's her position as journalists. Right. That's the... And she's the one who got the first interview. Right. I think it's because... I think Donald Trump said something nasty about her, so that obviously... About Stephanie Rule. Right, which is why you instantly get elevated. I don't know Stephanie Rule. We did not overlap. I, I once worked there. Um, mm -hmm. She's good on camera, but I I haven't seen her on TV in a long time because I don't have a TV. But right. she- You're uh, free. I, well, I am kind of free, but yeah. I also miss stuff. So I'm grateful that you're filling me in. That's amazing <laughs> that she said that. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm, I just want to boil it down. And these are just my perceptions and mm -hmm. you can obviously disagree, but- I don't think you're likely to get a Kamala Harris interview. Hope springs eternal. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very true. She has, uh, it's been reported that she has an enemies list of reporters because she's very thin skinned when it comes to coverage. She yes. hates anything poorly written. And I think one of the biggest examples of that was when she was very angry with the Vogue cover that came out after she won the vice presidency. She was very displeased with this Vogue cover of her standing there in her chucks you know, her, her sneakers. And uh, she was very upset by that. It was one of the first controversies of her life. So Vogue was too tough on her? Vogue was ran and very insensitive, racially insensitive, ignorant cover. 
And she was very displeased by that. What, was it a candid? She didn't know she was posing for a Vogue photo No, she shoot? was posing. She just didn't know that would be the cover. She got to choose the outfits and the background, but that was supposed to be inside the magazine, but not, it was not the cover. to put her on the oh, cover? Oh, she was very upset about it. People found it very demeaning. Are you serious? Yeah. It was one of the biggest controversies, before she even took office, this was one of the biggest controversies of her career. And that was the even, controversy. Even the, the narcissism Biden of rich people in this country is just, it really yeah. doesn't have Even limits. the Biden team, communications team was like, can we tone it down a little bit? We don't want this to be the first major controversy of our ministry, or of our we haven't even taken office yet, and this is already. What been. was racially insensitive about it? I'm not sure. I think portraying her in a casual manner was uh, something she did not appreciate. Well, I thought she was she was a joyful warrior, a joyful casual warrior. <laughs> <laughs> so you just you just can't with someone like that, right? But the point is, is that she has an enemy's list of reporters who don't appreciate her rise to power, and any time that they stray from the official Kamala Harris narrative, then she's not going to do an interview with you. Which is why you have um, so many reporters being very cautious, very careful. And she certainly earned that reputation throughout her whole presidential campaign. I mean, reporters and editors were very familiar with getting angry responses from the way they covered Kamala Harris as a presidential candidate. I honestly feel like this is like uh, some kind of weird right-wing parody meant to discredit people like Kamala Harris. I mean— She's she's like living down to every stereotype, like totally fragile, indecisive, narcissistic. Like this is not the female leadership <clears throat> we were promised at all. This is like right. Are this all is discrediting? Are yeah. all politicians narcissistic? Yes, pretty much. They are well, right. for sure. Oh, so, definitely. She's not the only one. I just right. want to be clear. <laughs> yeah, but also you know being thin skinned, narcissistic, um, very adamant about how you're covered. Um, and very angry with how you're treated, that's kind of... If she called a Vogue racist, then we're dealing with like... I don't think she actually fragile. said that, but people close to her were upset of it for that that's reason. Insane. Yeah. Okay. Um, last question. Are you going to make sure that she sees this interview? Do you think she'll watch this? Are you going to send this over to her press team? Yeah, I think I will and see if they have any response. But uh, ultimately... I think that's going to affect your There's access. a lot of people who are talking about Kamala Harris in a way that she would not approve of. Yeah. And up, up until this point, she's decided just to ignore it. But I think, like, there's enough people talking about, you've had some great people on who, including an attorney from San Francisco, what's her? Harmeet Dillon, yeah. Harmeet. Very, very, she was not a source for the book, but very insightful. Yeah. Growing up in that neighborhood and yeah. experiencing Kamala Harris for who she is. I mean, very insightful interview. And I think there's a lot of people talking about who the real Kamala Harris is that I think that's why ultimately she feels like she has to come out and do a media tour because she has to distract from the conversations that are actually taking place. It's not working well. You'd think she'd feel obligated just because that's how democracy works. Voters have a right to information about you before they vote on you. Right. But she doesn't feel that way. Well, and obviously as these news institutions lose the power to control the masses— and cheerlead for you, even though you don't give them interviews, then what's the benefit? Yeah, I mean, we don't have a working, it's just North Korean press agency here. So, yeah. Well, ble bless you and the Daily Mail and anyone else who retains a commitment to telling the truth, you know, imperfectly because we're people, but, you know, right. trying. Um, I don't think we can function as a free country without it so I appreciate you doing it well thanks so much for having me Charlie thank you very much so it turns out that YouTube is suppressing our show I know shocking that in an election year with everything at stake Google would be putting its thumb on the scale and preventing you from hearing anything that the people in charge don't want you to hear, but it turns out it's happening. So what can you do about it? Well, we could whine about it, but that's a waste of time. We're not in charge of Google. Or we could find a way around it, a way that you could actually get information that's true. It's not intentionally deceptive. And the way to do that on YouTube, we think, is to subscribe to our channel. Subscribe, and you'll have a much higher chance 
of hearing what we say, and we hope you will. <laughs>